welcome everyone to our webinar today. Uh, there are still people just joining us, um, so we'll give them a couple of minutes to come online. Thank you everyone who's here already. I'm Naomi and I've got with me Michael and Oliver from Substance. Do you want to say hello? Hello everyone, hello. Um, so today we're here to give an update on the reproducible document stack project um, that Substance and eLife started back in September with some work before earlier in the year. Um, very quickly, I'm just going to give an introduction to eLife um, and the project, and then I'll run through the agenda for the call today, and we can get on to the more interesting, juicy bits from Michael and Oliver. So, eLife, in case anyone isn't aware, we're a non-profit organisation, and we're funded by these funders um, in order to help improve research communication in the life sciences. As part of this, we have an innovation initiative where we invest in open source technologies, tools and processes to improve the way that cutting edge research is discovered, shared, consumed and evaluated. We very much care about encouraging responsible behaviours in science, and this includes reproducibility. Um, and we develop our own technologies in house open source as well as supporting external projects. The idea for this project came from the fact that we're working with a system that prioritises sharing research results as a flat manuscript um, that's a, a narrative for, for the project and then often the resources like data, code, other materials, the methods used to actually derive those results are shared as separate assets. Uh, and we are aware of demand from researchers and also uh, a wish for uh, publishers to share a much more embedded, richer version of the research results story. Uh, so our vision for the reproducible document uh, is something that would encapsulate usable code and data within the flow of the manuscript um, and that the reader would have an option to progress from a much uh, the, the, the static research article that you see today to something more rich, more details there and even more interactive. Um, this project, we very much intend it to be platform, tool and language agnostic. It's not about guiding researchers to use specific products and we'd like whatever the output is to be uh, usable by anyone, depending on what their own work preferences are. Um, we would also like it to be accessible for everyone. Um, so that includes supporting people who are, are very computationally liter literate, as well as supporting researchers who prefer to use um, uh, guided tools. And the ultimate aim is to encourage the reuse of published research, encourage the use of open data, encourage reuse of code methods, um, and to help the research community to build on some the excellent work that's out there already. So we've done some work last year to start to map out what this uh, process might be, the kind of tools we might need, the, to identify some gaps and some concerns involving lots of stakeholders. This was from a workshop back in June last year. Um, and the project that started in September is uh, to produce uh, an authoring platform a format for the reproducible document, which we're calling the reproducible document archive, um, and also tools for the publisher in order to actually publish these documents as they come in. For us, we're very much trying to innovate openly. This is not us trying to produce something um, to win a tools race. We would definitely like anything produced to be future proof um, and to be something that's very easy for researchers to use, but also for publishers to adopt. Um, and it's important for us that any dependencies are minimized. It was a clear concern from the outset that um, a lot of people have tried similar things before and often things can break um, over time as, as libraries change, as functions change. And so we want to minimize that. This is a project that's in collaboration with Substance. So Michael and Oliver are from Substance. They're joining us here today. They're the main developers on this project. They're also working with Nakomo Bentley on Stencilla, which is one of the platforms, the tools that's very much related to this project. Um, and if you'd like more information, there are several links here. The PDF for these slides are in handouts. There's a handouts tab in your GoToWebinar control panel. So you can easily access all of the slides today, including these links. Um, so today we will start with Michael going through a user interface um, for how researchers might start to put together these more reproducible, reproducible documents, uh, including a live demo of the work on Stencilla so far. Um, this is of particular interest to researchers, people who work closely with researchers, um, and we welcome your feedback about 
what, what's been done so far, any elements you really like, any features you'd really like to see. There is a Google Doc in the chat. There's a link to a Google Doc, and there's some questions there already for you to contribute to. Please feel free. Um, we will then move on to Oliver, who will take us through the specifications for this format that we've got already, so the reproducible document format. Um, and there are some questions we'd like to ask about that uh, specification. This might be of great interest to people working in um, the technical infrastructure around reproducibility, which I'm aware that we've got a few of you online with us today. Thank you for coming. Again, there's questions about this in the Google Doc. Please feel free to contribute while we're on this call or later. Um, and we'll also have time at the end for general discussion. So please feel free to bring up any points uh, during uh, that time at the end. Throughout, there will be a couple of polls that we're going to ask you to identify yourself. If you'd like to have more um, deeper conversations with us, perhaps one-to-one -one later with specific points, very detailed technical points, uh, we're very open to having those discussions with you. We'd like this to be de developed very much as a collaboration with the wider community. So please answer those polls when they come along, if that's something you'd like to do. We'll collect that information. We can be in touch with you later to, um, to arrange those calls. So you can on GoToWebinar also get involved today. So I am able to unmute you if you'd like to ask a question yourself. Um, you may see a similar kind of control panel as this, um, and there's various different options uh, for you to run through. So you can use the chat at the very bottom, and that's simple. It's, it will be sent to everyone on the webinar, but you, you can ask a question there if you'd like. There's also um, a, a, a section called questions where you can put in a specific question, and that will notify me that you've asked a question. And I can either ask to unmute you, and you can ask it yourself, or I can ask the question for you to um, Michael and Oliver, and they can answer it for everyone on the call. Um, and as I said, there's the link to the Google Doc in the chat right now. So please do feel, to, feel free to jump onto that and to start to contribute. There is a bit at the top that asks us uh, ask you to put your name and your organization. That's really useful. It's not required, but it'd be really useful for us to know who has been contributing on the doc. Um, and please respond to those polls if they're of interest to you as we get to them. So kicking off to start off with, um, we've got Michael talking about the Sensor interface. We just need to briefly switch who's presenting here, so bear with us for 10 seconds. Michael, mm -hmm. I'm going to make you the presenter, okay? Okay. So. Oops. Okay, so we're just switching. If anyone's got any any kind of questions, even if your, your webinar's not working well, please feel free to stick it in the chat or the questions, and I'll respond as I can. So does everyone see the... Um, the, the browser window and hear me? I can see it. I can see it. <laughs> okay, perfect. So it should work. Okay. So, uh, yeah, again, hi, everyone. Um, and, and thanks, Naomi, for the introduction. Um, my name is Michael Aufreiter from Substance. And um, so we are a company based in Linz in Austria, and we basically work on open source web based editing software. And that we're doing for the past seven years or so and supporting different projects. And one of those is uh, Stencilla. Um, so we've been involved um, a lot into the development. Um, and just to give you some background, like uh, Nokomi Bentley, um, he's from New Zealand and he's a former fisheries scientist. Um, he was kind of uh, dissatisfied with the, with the tools and workflows that were available. And that kind of motivated him to yeah, to create his own tools for himself and his colleagues. And that's basically, yeah, the, the beginnings of Stencilla. Um, Stencilla, in the scope of the reproducible document stack, as I now explained, um, it's taking the piece of authoring. So that solves the, the authoring um, piece. And with Stencilla, you create and edit so-called reproducible document archives, which means um, you're basically able to submit such an archive that you produced and submit it to a journal. And the journal is then able to not only publish a static view of the manuscript as it's done currently, but also a, like an enhanced reproducible view right on the journal page. So that's the general vision. OK, so um, looking at the user interface, what you see here, um, is a publication that consists of two documents. Um, one is the manuscript, and another one is uh, a data sheet. 
So these are kind of bundled together. Um, looking at the article, um, you will notice that there's some metadata, um, and this is particularly modeled after chats. So behind the scenes here, there's like the chats XML format working. So we chose that because that's um, what journals require. And we just want to make the transition from the authoring to the journal as seamless as possible. Um, so just to give you the thing, you can just um, yeah, edit a new author, and this will update the metadata. And the tool also supports you to um, yeah, cite references. Um, and you don't need to worry about citation styles, etc. So that's for the general um, scientific authoring tool. And now um, the novelty of, of Stencilla is um, yeah, adding reproducibility into the, those kind of manuscripts. And therefore, we have um, introduced cells. And cells are essentially expressions. So you can really compare this to um, Microsoft Excel, for instance. So you can just like do some numeric computations and call functions, for instance. Um, and yeah, we, we are evaluating that um, on keystrokes. So basically, you see the result uh, immediately. Um, we've also got some, some aids, like a documentation about the function that you can bring up. Um, Okay, so that's that's basically how a cell works. Um, what it can do, so we have multiple cells and um, you can have like numbers one and assign it a variable essentially. And we do another one. And we would then be able to Plot these cells. So, and as you can see, like um, this cell here depends on these two other cells. And if I change them, I immediately see the output. Okay. So this is um, like given that we have a full function library, and like there's a lot of functions available. This will serve. Um, for many uses, like this would be enough for many uses, but there's still things that we haven't covered and that's not part of the libraries. It's like where Excel is not enough where you start programming. And in our case, you can switch the language from what we call mini. This is just not um, like a name for expression, Excel expression. We call that mini because it's not doing much. Um, and switch it to JavaScript. And now we are able to just write a piece of JavaScript, which also gets ev uh, evaluated immediately. So we see as a result this error here. And we're going to um, expose that again as numbers one. And then we should see the chart update accordingly. Yeah, and we can change things here as well. So yeah, that's that's the basics about cells. And you can imagine you can implement different ones. Some are displaying information, others are computing information. Um, here's another. Um, so basically what we wanted to do here is um, to actually transclude the data here. So this is our source data, the data that we want to analyze and um, use it from the, from the manuscript. Um, we just haven't uh, managed to implement that until today. So we're just making up that information again within the document. And uh, such a table data structure is very handy. We can just um, filter um, on that information. So for instance, can change here. And yeah, do more interesting things like uh, polyglot programming. So for filtering, um, and, and, and grouping data, uh, SQL is a pretty nice tool. So we thought, OK, let's take this table that we defined here and manipulate it uh, with SQL and store it as a new table. And yeah, let's just see the output here. This is basically the, the sum. And we could um, switch to 
let's say minimum or average. And yeah, this just takes a uh, place in the, in the regular flow of the document. And lastly, you see a figure. So this is really like, a, like people that know chats know that the figure consists of a label and um, a title and the caption. So we have all that. But the figure itself is not just a static image. It's, in this case, um, a figure produced in R. And that's also updating according uh, to the inputs. If I change the, the data here, it would also um, change the chart. Um, yeah, that's mostly so. Oh, here you see the references, which you can also manipulate. Um, but I just wanted to. Um, switch really quick to the sheet, which is another type of interface. So the whole idea behind it is um, to kind of uh, replicate um, familiar user interfaces, not to get into the way, like not to require programming actually. And you can just use this as you would do with Excel and you can call functions. And you may want to plot things here. Yeah, and if you change the data, it reflects the chart. Yeah. And then there is, um, so we consider we kind of opened the bigger discussion. So Nokomi was traveling and uh, visiting lots of um, research organizations and um, universities to discuss what could be done better in a spreadsheet interface. Um, and one of the ideas was to introduce a source mode, for instance, um, to be able to see the, the data, like the, the values, the results, and the, the formulas at once. It's just <coughs> one small thing. Um, we've also um, introduced, uh, firstly, column names so that you can basically uh, assign a name to a column. But you can also assign a type, and this is useful later on to check if um, if a, a cell uh, contains um, the wrong uh, type. For instance, if I would type uh, text, I would get a warning, and that's also like useful to avoid common errors. Yeah, that's that's it from my side. Good timing. Brilliant. Thank you very much. OK, so we've got uh, 10 minutes or so for discussion specifically about this, um, this element of the project. If anyone would like to ask a question, uh, please feel free to stick it in the, in the question box in GoToWebinar. Michael, I wonder if you could switch to the Google Doc um, in your screen, okay. since we're showing your screen already. Um, mm -hmm. We have some questions coming in. Um, I can, JV Polin, you've got a couple of questions actually that you've asked already. Um, I will try to unmute you now if that's okay. Uh, you can send in a response as a question if that's easier for you to say no, don't unmute me. I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, unmute you JB and you can ask your questions. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I was uh, I was wondering with the uh, the relation with the Jupyter Notebook project because it sounds uh, so uh, close to it. Uh, the, uh, it looks like uh, you know merging the two projects would be a good idea if uh, it's an open source community. Uh, but uh, I'm sure there are technical or other reasons for like, uh, having a second uh, different project. I just would like to you know have your perspective on that. Uh, the other questions I had was more on the. Uh, uh, are all the changes versioned? Uh, you know, like if I change some stuff in the uh, sp uh, spreadsheet, uh, are those, those changes version versioned in uh, some uh, some ways? And can I go back? Uh, or do, I mean, I also was wondering if you could use Plotly in this uh, in the uh, in the document and uh, what kind of a uh, and I had technical questions, but I need to just look at the uh, the GitHub repo first. Uh, <laughs> I would I don't want mm -hmm. to uh, bother people with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, the first question is about uh, why Tensilla is uh, trying to well, provide another implementation of something, or you know, probably you mean something like uh, Jupyter or similar projects, right? 
So there are notebooks and software around uh, out there uh, providing a mixture of text blocks and code cells. And uh, if there's a possibility to mix or uh, join the two efforts, I mean, there's one key difference to those uh, implementations like Jupyter. Uh, Stencilla is trying to approach the problem from a, um, we call them clicker, so a simple non text savvy user, so the reader which is not familiar with programming. And Jupyter is very uh, code intensive, you know, it's code, coding first. You see the code blocks um, yeah, as a first class um, object, <coughs> and also the interaction. Um, it's, it's, we thought uh, Excel is, uh, is a good example where people actually are programming, but they don't know that or don't realize that they are actually programming. And to introduce something which is very similar to use, where you just um, use functions and combine them with simple, simple operators, is, uh, is also a good. Um, has a good chance to be adopted by uh, non tech savvy users. Absolutely, yeah. But secondly, like the other angle that we're coming from is like we wanted to, so in the collaboration with Elif, um, to make a manuscript reproducible. And that's something that hasn't been covered by any of these other projects, like really to fulfill all the criteria that the manuscript needs to fulfill. And so that's why we were settling on chats and. Uh, besides the user interface, I mean, Oli will talk about that. Uh, Zone is the, the data format, essentially, like this reproducible document archive. And this is meant to be um, a generic solution, not specific to Stencilla. Mm. Um, and we want to be able to integrate um, all the other projects, or we, we don't see each other, uh, see us as a competitor, you know, to those projects because they are really strong in, in different areas. We just want to establish something, a standard, together with eLife and other journals that uh, eventually makes it possible, you know, to submit a manuscript to a journal and have it published as is. Because currently, uh, the only way to yeah, publish reproducible research is like as an asset, as an, as an attachment to uh, a Word manuscript, which, uh, which has the main um, article in it. And we really want to kind of uh, yeah, solve that on this higher level. Mm -hmm. That has not been done, and that's basically like mm -hmm. why we're doing this work. The second part of the question was: Does Stencilla uh, uh, allow versioning? And um, the answer is yes. Basically, currently we are still finishing the application or working on the application, so it will um, do that. Yes. So even even real time collaboration, uh, but also offline editing and classical type of versioning. Okay, thank you. So we've got some questions come in from Conrad Hinson. Uh, Conrad, I'm going to unmute you now. Afterwards, we've got Stephen Eglin, and then we might move to some questions on the document. So Conrad, I am just unmuting you. Okay, yes, I, I am unmuted. Um, yeah, I was wondering in the presentation about these uh, polyglot stuff, uh, how do you handle data exchange between different languages in a way that will still work five years from now? Um, I mean, this is kind of a um, serialization format in Stencilla, which we define. So there's a, a specific set of um, primitive types and a general implementation in every language uh, to map those um, data types to native ones. And I think the plain old data types won't change in the next years so yeah. in these languages. Yeah. They're running in JavaScript, right? So we have objects and arrays yeah. and, and numbers and strings. And, and in Python, they are mapped to, I mean, like ints and, um, and arrays as well and, and data tables and the same with R. So there's basically a kind of a application specific data type system which is mapped to native plain old data types. Thank you. And Stephen, I'm just going to unmute you now. OK, thank you, Naomi. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I've got two quick questions. Um, first of all, I'm curious if you know how these uh, documents might scale beyond toy examples. So I've seen lots of interfaces like this before, and they really don't scale when you do real world sort of research computation within them. The solution. Actually, so, Honestly, we we didn't have a good stress test yet, done a stress test yet. Uh, what we know from a huge document in general, like uh, just 
long document, that's not a problem. And we don't know yet. Uh, I mean, the internal representation of this kind of dependency graph is, is executed very locally. But if you had a kind of a sheet with uh, where every data is dependent on, on, on the other data, so every change, change of the whole sheet, we probably uh, yeah see some slowdown, definitely. So it's kind of, I would say, I mean, it, it depends on the dependency graph, but if you have a logarithmic kind of uh, distance of dependencies, then the complexity is um, like that, like, like logarithmic. But if you have a kind of full graph, dependency graph, where every, I mean, there are no cycles allowed, obviously, so it's probably linear, maximum. Mm -hmm. As generally, I mean, we are trying to get this thing as self-contained as possible. So one aim is to kind of put as much as possible into this archive, um, so we can like later run it without any dependencies, like outside dependencies, grid computing systems, etc. And we thought, of course, of these like long-running um, tasks that you cannot perform in your local computer. Um, that's something that's not realized yet, but like um, we have a kind of an idea to um, be able to connect to a remote resource which does the like heavy number crunching and returns uh, like an aggregated result um, that we can then store in the document in order to at least provide some reprodu uh, reproducibility without the external dependency. So the general rule is yes, we want to connect like larger systems, but uh, only if there is also a snapshot version um, that we can basically run this, um, yeah, without. So that that's one goal. And a lot of the computation is actually done in in, in those uh, execution contexts, like like it is happening in Jupyter, where you, the actual number crunching is done in R or in Python. So if you manage to organize your uh, uh, overall program to just um, glue to aggregate the data on a higher level. And, and, and in a simple way and do the hard computing uh, in, in the course, then I think this will work pretty well. Okay. Okay, thanks very much uh, for answering that. Michael, I'm gonna pick myself presenter again so that I can run through all of his mm -hmm. slides, if that's okay. Oh, perfect. Thanks for everyone's questions. There are a lot more questions in um, the Google document. Some specific feedbacks asked. There's also an area for general feedback. Um, if we've got time at the end, we can take some more questions on this element. Um, this and also, if you would like to uh, get in touch with us directly about this um, particular part of the project, um, I'm just asking a poll right now. If you'd like to click yes or maybe if you want to talk to us directly um, off the Google document um, about this, please put your hand up now. I'll give you 10 more seconds. <laughs> okay, the numbers are pretty stable. So I'm going to close that poll. Thanks very much for doing that. Um, and hopefully, uh, can you see my screen? Can you see the Google yes. document? Yes. Excellent. Um, so there are, as I said, there are some questions here. Um, thanks everyone who's already started to put in their names and some feedback, that's brilliant. Um, we could get in touch with you. If you name what your comment is uh, and would like a response, then we can respond to you on that. Um, but otherwise we'll use this as feedback. So thank you very much. Um, and then we're gonna move on to, and can you see my slides? Yeah, hopefully. I'm going to move on to Oliver. If you just say next, I'll move your slides across if that's okay. Okay, fine. Yep. So I'm, I'm going to talk about um, the reproducible document archive. So um, since September, we were um, discussing how to approach that and um, looking at um, several solutions, existing solutions like research objects and um, other things like CB, uh, CWL and, and stuff like that. And also thinking about the container, container, the containerization problems. And finally, we came up with something more like a set of uh, decisions right now. Actually, the solution we propose is pretty simple from the, from, the, from the file format point of view. 
So uh, basically, it's all about the document archive, um, not very surprising. It should be as self-contained as possible. So uh, the author should pack all, um, all the data into which is possible to, to be packed. So um, maybe there are uh, some situations where you have terabytes uh, image data or something like that. There will be problems properly, but in many cases, this will be possible. There will be a, a manifest file that basically describes how, what, which types of, or which, what kind of data is in the, in the archive. There will be resources of different types, and there uh, is metadata specifying how the environment uh, should be set up. In a later phase of a um, publication of a document, there will be a read-only version uh, like a like a HTML version, like you know from EPUB or something. So next, please. Oh, there's a link to the uh, to the Git repo if you're interested to click on that at some point. Okay, now next. So the resources we currently consider are um, articles. So that's basically um, um, the narrative, um, a manuscript. So what you would um, edit in Microsoft Word, for example. Then you have spreadsheets uh, to um, to work on data, and there will be assets like images, audio, videos, etc. And to be able to extend the whole system with user code, so custom source code, there will be user functions or user function libraries. Then there is always this kind of discussion if uh, notebooks are an extra type of resource or uh, just a special type of article. We think it's more like an um, article without a title and uh, abstract, probably. So um, probably we just cover that use case uh, using articles. And in a future version, we want to add slides as well, so that it's possible to, to add the presentation to the publication at some point. OK. Next, please. So, um, talking about reproducibility. Um, reproducibility doesn't come um, per se by the document archive. So it's more like defined by the content bundle in the archive. Um, basically, the idea is if manuscript data and methods are, are there, it's uh, probably possible to, to reproduce, reproduce the described results. But there's also a technical precondition that you need to be able to replicate the runtime environment used to um, pr um, process the data and run the methods. Um, that is, uh, furthermore, not, furthermore not, not all. You also need some kind of best practices how to create such a content. So it's not probably will be not enough just to pack all the source code, but you probably want to somehow close the gap between the reader and the programmer. What we want to achieve is provide best practices, show the um, authors how to increase the compre uh, comprehensibility and how to make the uh, code more reusable. So for example, by introducing functions, instead of um, creating so-called spaghetti code in notebooks, is probably uh, more useful for other, other authors than just, um, yeah. Source code hidden in a, in a notebook. There are going to be limitations like very large, large data and, or special hardware um, or data with access restrictions. To some of the problems, there will be solutions, and to some of them, there won't probably. A very large data is possibly uh, can be solved by providing at least a snapshot, uh, snapshot of pre processed data. So, for example, if you have a set of terabyte images and um, do some feature extraction. You could then store the feature extraction or the, the result of the feature extraction in, in a CSV file and allow um, the readers to at least uh, follow or rerun the computation after that uh, first um, aggregation step. Optionally, there could be um, the data available for uh, download. So you could uh, include uh, that uh, URL, for example, so it could be a decentralized repository that um, interested users could replicate and then do the full processing. Um, for the data access uh, problem, if that is the situation, then there's probably only the solution, which is probably also what people do right now, to aggregate and obfuscate the, the data. Okay, now thanks. Next slide. 
Next slide. So talking about the articles, so we went for a JATS format because JATS is just um, a very expressive document format, open document format for scientific content. And what we have been working on is trying to disambiguate JATS. So we call it JATS for machines, JATS for M. Um, basically by providing a strict guideline how to use JATS uh, to avoid ambiguities. We added uh, guidelines how to um, encode figures backed by source code, we call reproducible figures, um, blocks of source code like cells. And uh, there's another thing we, which we want to, want to add as inputs. For example, the author could add a slider for a certain variable so that the reader can play with, uh, with uh, settings and, and, and change the outcome to understand, and explore them, uh, the methods. Uh, transclusions is another mechanism uh, we want to add. So it's possible to uh, use, to reference areas, ranges uh, in a sheet from within an article or just to uh, write a plot um, command using um, uh, data from a sheet or something like this, or maybe even a, using an image created in a sheet. If you want, you can see the current state of the specs of the chats for M uh, uh, behind that link. Thank you very much. Um, the next thing is spreadsheets. We are developing is still a document format we call currently just sheet ML or sheet XML. Um, it's, uh, we could not use existing formats because of uh, like the open office format, because, uh, open document format, because it's too much about representation, uh, not semantic enough for us. And so we, we started basically to, to uh, come up with a custom prototype of a document format. The spreadsheet support custom functions in, in, in kind of every language supported by Stimsilla. So you, it's basically Excel, which can be um, extended uh, via custom function. And we support best practices like typing of columns and automatic validation. OK, next slide, please. The runtime environment is a um, high topic, uh, which can be solved nowadays pretty easily, probably. So our take is to that uh, the author should choose from an existing uh, set of runtime images. Um, they are like uh, uh, container images uh, that like you use in Docker, or uh, what we saw the um, open container initiative is trying to standardize these type of containers. Uh, these could be provided in a decentralized or centralized way so that the people can choose and re uh, share uh, such images. Together with uh, functions included in the archive, it should uh, provide the authors with capabilities to, to derive, to go further from these shared um, images and add custom functions. There will be a necessary a unified service interface for the runtime, for the running runtime environment. Uh, we consider HTTP uh, endpoints for that. Uh, basically, the, the uh, greatest common divisors to just to provide a function uh, to execute code blocks, so uh, blocks of source code. If that is possible, then you probably can attach it to something like Stanzilla. There might be edge cases. We have not discussed that yet in detail, where uh, the author could include a recipe for creating environment. So it's, if it's about special hardware or if it cannot be uh, covered by, by Docker images. OK, thank you. Next slide, please. I think I'm already at the end. You are. Yes. Um, OK, <laughs> thank you. Um, so we anticipate there being quite, there's a lot of detail there, and we anticipate a lot of questions. So I'm going to run a poll quickly again, just asking whether any of you would be interested to speak about any of those specific points in great detail um, but beyond this call today. If you'd just like to uh, click your options, please. I'll give you another 10 seconds or so. And then we'll move into um, some, sp some questions that you might have about any of those elements. Um, there are also questions on the Google Doc. Um, I'm aware that some people couldn't see the Google Doc link earlier. Uh, so if you're having a problem, just drop me a question to say, please, can I have the link? And I'll send you that link. OK, closing that poll. Right. So moving on to questions. Does anyone have any questions to ask about any of these elements? 
One thing you can do is to put your hand up as an attendee. There's a little hand logo. Uh, if you do that, I can come to you and um, unmute you to take your question. OK, I'm not seeing any hands up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to the um, to the Google Doc and we can run through that and, see, and use that as a, a way to think about questions. So can you see my Google Doc screen? Yep, as we can see it. Yeah. Oliver, do you, would you like to run through this and take control? Um, yeah, I can. Um, where we, uh, with the questions, you mean like going through the questions? Yeah, what yeah. would you like to hear from people? Um, I, I mean, the, yeah, maybe we scroll. There have been additions. Like, okay, I need to scan first. Mm. Oh, Don't think we've got any. Wait, uh -huh. uh, just... These are general questions, but um, yeah, I mean, we could talk about this like mm -hmm. Jupyter markdown integration. I mean, just generally, um, we would use this opportunity to just get some initial thoughts in, you know, from, from any of you. And then we are completely open to talk individually afterwards mm -hmm. um, with different organizations. We've already um, talked with research objects, for instance, and um, Code Ocean. And we kind of, you know, really want to figure out where are the, the common parts and yeah, can, can we establish something that's really interoperable? We, we don't want to create an island. We're really, we're really open to any inputs from the outside. I mean, Stencilla itself might be a bit opinionated about the way it wants to communicate with the, um, with the backend, but in general, the reproducible document stack is agnostic or should be agnostic. And um, what we thought about Jupyter, I mean, we already have, have, have played around with using Jupyter as a backend for Stantilla. So that is definitely possible. Uh, uh, on the other hand, you uh, lose a bit the um, unique selling points of Jupyter, you know, the, the multi line uh, uh, REPL kind of thing where you get uh, errors on every line and stuff like that. And um, what we thought could be interesting to have a dedicated integration of, uh, of Jupyter into, into to that editor into Stentina and maybe reducing some of the, um, the features which uh, uh, Stentina is using, like transclusions or uh, we need to discuss how to do that. So it would, for example, be possible to include a Jupyter notebook, let Jupyter create some images and then use the images in the manuscript. That's um, pretty, I think, straightforward. Mm -hmm. it, <clears throat> or maybe um, so, uh, use some results in, in the spreadsheets or something like that. So that's basically so these two directions. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just saying we've got a we had a hand up from Stephen Eglin who I can unmute mm -hmm. now if he's if he's got a question to ask. Uh, I'm trying to unmute you. Okay, Stephen, you're unmuted. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um. So, I'm just wor I'm kind of slightly worried about a new format turning up, and I'm really heartened to see that you're thinking seriously about the sort of the Jupiter and the R Markdown community. I mean, to, from my experience, R Markdown does pretty much everything that I ever need uh, mm. with NITAR and the caching. It's fantastic. From what I've heard today, I think the only reason you wouldn't want to adopt R Markdown is because of the problem with translating to JATS at the end of the day. Um, yeah. And I, th I thought that was actually already a solved problem through uh, Pandoc. So I'm slightly cautious about that. But putting that to one side, would I mean I think you would, the problem is is that I think Stencilla and when I did this sort of the feedback uh, a few months ago, it was really aimed at sort of making things easy to use, mm -hmm. and probably what you're talking about is a different set of users. If I look, I you know I know several other people on the call. I mean, your your primary okay. users at the start are going to be sort of people who are already very familiar with these kinds of technologies, and so actually mm -hmm. the the number one thing I would try and urge you to do is actually make this sort of transition to JATS actually seamless behind the scenes. Mm. So that people yeah. who have already got Jupyter documents and R Markdown documents doing, yeah. you know, writing their full papers 
can just run a little script and convert it to, you know, the JATS format, and then it can get published immediately. I mean, I mm. think the problem that you're going to face is that, you know, the the power users are not going to switch unless they see a good reason to. Um, so mm. the more that you can reach out to that community yeah. first, I think the more you'll build up a, mm. uh, a big user base. Yeah, no, we are aware of that, definitely. Um, so I think that's one track really to, I mean, the, um, the archive format um, is pretty much open. It's, it's more or less just a manifest file that just points to different types. And each of these types, like uh, the chats is just a standard. So we don't introduce something new really. It's really just this, um, yeah, kind of the top level thing that pulls things together because that just doesn't exist at the moment. Um, and with regards to conversion, yeah, so that if there was a way to convert a Jupyter notebook or um, an R markdown file to chats 4 m including the reproducible elements, you would be able to submit that. You wouldn't even need a uh, stencilla for that. You could just have a command line tool that does that. Um, the things that are missing then is, of course, like metadata, but the journal could add that later on. And additionally, you could even open it then in Sensiva and continue working there. Um, so basically just doing your, using your preferred tools. Then in the final phase, that's important because I think closing the loop and then be able to edit an R markdown file in Stencilla. It's also something we're thinking about, but that's going to be a hard part to really close the loop and to have the converter so stable. And so, you know, you always need to, with each feature that gets added to R markdown or to Stencilla, this needs to be synchronized. So this could get um, a bit hard. And then the third option that Oliver just mentioned was really including um, Jupyter notebooks as is into the publication and publishing them as a as currently like as an attachment, but embedded in in one archive. So these are really bundled together then, and there is a standardized way of accessing and rendering them, etc. So I think there are many options open. I don't know today what's really the best one. It, mm -hmm. I, I'm really curious what what do people want? Like what, what would be their preferred workflow when? Mm -hmm. Because so the, the general question is, I am a data scientist and I use the tools X and Y, and how can I so send something to, for instance, eLife and get that published in the most nice way on their uh, journal page, in the most integrated way? And these are the answers, I like the things in between that we want to solve and help solve, but ideally together with all those uh, communities and um, yeah, not in competition in this case. Mm. We've had a, a similar question to that point. Conrad, I'm struggling to unmute you, so I'll ask it for you. If neither Stencilla nor Jupyter nor RStudio are good enough for my needs, what are my options? Um, so basically, um, the question is about how to solve the, uh, this problem in a general way, right? So the reproducible, create how to create reproducible documents without Stencilla and Jupyter. Um, I mean, the, you need to think about what, what is a reproducible document. If it's just uh, provide the, the source code and some script, I mean, there are solutions probably already. Uh, we think, I mean, that's just writing a manuscript using uh, images uh, generated from source, uh, from running some source code. But then you, I mean, that's probably okay. That's, um, you can, you can still create something like this archive and pack all the data. Now the question is how much you increase the re reproducibility or how the author ma made it easy for uh, readers to reuse their codes. That's, that's about the best practices I was talking about. So I think the tools could um, foster certain workflows, which you definitely could uh, come up with a different tool chain as well but um, maybe using yeah, custom other uh, tools to achieve the similar result. Does that answer the question? So we um, have some questions from um, earlier on as well about Stencilla, which we can move to now. I am having problems with GoToWebinar with unmuting people. Um, ben, if you are there, no, I can't unmute you. I'm sorry, the, the program is trying to crash. But I will ask the question for you. So his question is, 
What about dependencies and versioning? If my code uses a particular R package, for example, how do you guarantee that the same package version will be used for reproducibility? I mean, this is all about these um, shared and maintained images, we think, the right way. So if there's a community maintained image containing a lot of um, well, all, of, all of the necessary uh, image uh, uh, packages in a certain field, that user should just use that and, and restrict themselves to use that specific version. So we are moving away from the allowing to specify uh, every detail, every dependency um, in a custom way, but rather choose an existing image or uh, provide an, a shared one. So I think many 99% of the users are fine with a maintained one, and the one person could uh, one person of the users could contribute their own kind of yeah. image. Then it's not like that you specify this package in this version, but you say I want to I, I use this image in that version. Yeah. But that's generally okay, the challenge you. at the moment, also with the other projects like Jupyter. Um, so how do you, if you customize some things and you spin up a custom Python session with some, I don't know, native modules um, included, um, how do you preserve that and uh, run it in the future? So that's also something that the two of us don't want to, that's not our expertise actually, but we want to find a good abstraction to say, we can identify an image by an identifier like image name and version. And then like the, the application or the system just knows how to retrieve that image and uh, yeah, start it and run it. And everything works without you know user intervention and like manual um, resolving of package versions and uh, resolving. I mean, you, you really have to get rid of these kind of package managers because they are um, unreliable uh, dependencies. So after a long time uh, support phase, <coughs> you might not even get your old um, module yeah. anymore, probably. So there might be really problems when you de really yeah. depend on them. So it's better to have a, an image somewhere around and uh, maintain that for long term. It's true, yeah. because yeah, who knows if the like node module uh, um, npm packages mm -hmm. will be available in ten years of time. I mean, I there was possibly, in, in JavaScript was, with npm there was one example where somebody uh, removed their their kind of um, their module and this broke a lot of projects. So you better not rely on the registry. Mm -hmm. OK, so we've got some time for some general questions, if anyone would like to uh, go ahead and ask those. We did have a, um, a clarification from Conrad about his question that um, if he chose to package up his code and data in any way that suits, suits him and write um, a top-level document referencing all of this, um, is there a format that he should use uh, without using any of the, the ones we know about? Hmm, a top level format. So that would mean, I mean, I think that could be a, um, an, a DAR archive, but just like including them as, um, as we talked before, just as separate document types. So like using Jupyter or using another language, just including that and the manuscript um, could be written in, in checks and pieced together like that. I mean, there there's many options, um, but I'm not completely sure I understood it. Like what's the, mm. what the exact use cases? Um, please just like shoot us an email or just put this in, in, into the document so we can uh, follow up later. There's also a question that um, you went, you mentioned earlier: research object. Um, and Nava Shetrit of uh, Wesai has asked whether there's any if you're able to elaborate on that, and is there any idea of collaborating with them on this on this format? Yeah, definitely. We're in, in touch uh, with Dion and Carol from uh, Research Object, and uh, we had a talk I don't know, a couple of months ago. And yeah, we hope to kind of just use their expertise, you know, to make the right decisions to pull in, um, like th they're working on ontologies, and we can pull in stuff that uh, mm -hmm. that is working. And we're completely open as long. I mean, it's just about the argumentation. Is does it make sense to introduce a thing? And um, 
if yes, definitely. So uh, same goes with uh, Code Ocean, for instance. I mean, they're basically just providing the execution environment. So we would have hopes that um, platforms like Code Ocean would support our uh, DAR format, for instance, and then be able to run them in addition to the traditional code repositories, which are published currently. So yeah, and just getting their feedback, does it make sense you know, to do it in this particular way? And um, so until September, we're just trying to uh, finish the picture. So currently, we've done the authoring part and uh, uh, modeling the format with the chats for m It's still a work in, in progress, but we have all the pieces in place that we wanted. And then next on, there will be tools to convert such an archive to a static web page um, and also including uh, like a reproducible runnable way. So what we want to do is um, yeah, publish that on the eLife site on the experimental uh, uh, part of the site and do that with a real world um, article that we're going to replicate an existing um, publication which has reproducible elements as a, a I think R markdown um, file and yeah, just put that out and then see what, uh, what the responses are and iterate on that. Okay, thank you. That brings us to the end of this call. Thank you very much for everyone who joined us uh, and who contributed. Um, please feel free to continue to add feedback to the Google mm -hmm. document. You will receive an email after this call with a link to that document in case you couldn't get on it um, during the call. Uh, that email will also include a copy of the recording. Please feel free to share that with any colleagues you think would be interested. And there'll be a link to opt in to further email updates about the project. We really do want to keep you informed and uh, able to contribute as, as this project progresses. Um, if you offer to talk any further about a particular element, we have that data and we'll be in touch with you. Um, and if you have any questions, my email is on the screen right there. Um, I'll be happy to connect you through to Michael and Oliver. Um, and I'm sure they'd be willing to share the email addresses too if they wanted. Um, uh, so just to say thank you. Thank you, Michael and Oliver. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for coming. And uh, we hope you have a good rest of your day, whichever time zone you are on. OK, cool. I will be ending the webinar now. Do you want to say Thanks. goodbye? Yeah, goodbye. And thank you very much. Uh, talk more. <laughs> <I hope. laughs> Ciao, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody.